it's so great to see people talking about soil health across the entire spectrum of social and economic sciences and now I'm here to represent kind of some of the, the scientific progress and needs and really excited to be talking about that. So I want to make the point in starting out that many of the soil health metrics that we're using um, have, have been around a very long time and it's really great to see their implementation and their use on a much, much wider scale. But at the same time, we should look at things like soil aggregation and infiltration and bulk density and even respiration. Some of these measurements have been around well over 50 years and some of them approaching uh, 100 years. And so with these exciting developments, in, including collaborations between people working on the science, the economics, the social angles, we really need to be also making sure that, we're, that the science, the basic science is progressing because we need to continue understanding the mechanisms that are underlying how soil organic matter forms, why bulk density responds in the way it does. And some of these types of developments are not going to result in instantaneous changes in soil health metrics, but it's really the future in terms of developing new and modern uh, techniques that help us evaluate soil quality and ultimately, and this is of course the goal, develop new management uh, techniques and uh, affordable management techniques or economical ones. And so today I'm going to talk about some research that we've been doing in my lab, uh, specifically related to the role of microbes in the formation of soil organic matter. And I think that this work is really beginning to point the way to different kinds of management that are in some ways counterintuitive and very contrary to the way we used to think about managing uh, for soil organic matter. So these are the two pathways of soil organic matter formation. I would imagine most of the people in this room would not be surprised by anything here. We have plant material that undergoes external degradation by uh, microbial enzymes and becomes non-living soil organic matter. That's how we historically thought most soil organic matter formed, that it was an exocellular process happening outside the microbial cell and that the leftover bits from decomposition became soil organic matter. Well, now we know that this top pathway is really important, that organic, that matter, most of it goes through the microbial cell and it's actually the microbial cell itself that's becoming uh, the, that non-living organic matter. It's not the leftover bits, those non-decomposable lignin type compounds, it's actually the microbial cell itself. And this suggests a very different type of management is necessary to build soil organic matter. One that promotes decomposition and promotes microbial biomass formation over time. And this is a nice picture that uh, Miltner had in a paper just showing a lysed bacteria cell in the soil, just a nice visual demonstration that it's these cell envelopes that become soil organic matter. And so we have these new concepts of soil organic matter that we have plant residues. Most of them are going through microbial biomass, so that's that mechanism on the right that you see there, before it becomes soil organic matter, okay? So most of, the microbial, most of the organic matter that we have forming is made up of microbial biomass. Um, and this calls to, uh, raises the importance of microbial physiological traits in forming soil organic matter, things like the growth efficiency of the microbe, how much of the plant residue that the microbe takes up becomes part of the microbial cell versus being respired as CO2. It becomes a really, really important feature of soil organic matter formation. So does the microbial growth rate. How fast are the microbes growing and reproducing influence how much biomass is produced over time. And this is some work that a student of mine, uh, Cynthia Kallenbach, who's now an assistant professor at McGill, published at the very end of 2016, a very fundamental benchtop laboratory work that I have to say piqued the interest of stakeholders and farmers in a way none of our applied work has, which really pointed to me the benefit of 
um, the basic research. I've had so many emails um, from farmers and also people who write for farming trade magazines wanting to talk about this article where we showed that we can basically form field-like soil organic matter, natural soil organic matter in the lab by feeding microbes nothing but glucose because it is again those microbial cells that become soil organic matter. And in this study we also showed that the amount of soil organic matter that forms is very closely related to both the microbial growth efficiency and the relative abundance of fungi in these systems. Again, pointing to the importance of the microbes, their physiology, and their growth characteristics in forming soil organic matter. It had much less to do with what they were eating than the type of microbe that was there and their functioning. So we wanted to uh, explore some of these questions about microbes and their physiology and the formation of soil organic matter in the context of cropping system diversification. This is an area where my lab has worked a lot over the years. Um, we have shown in a lot of different studies the benefits of crop rotations. I know that there's a lot of people in this room working on crop rotations as well and are very interested in in that, and of course, rotating crops, it alters the chemistry and quality of plant carbon inputs. It changes the temporal diversity and timing and spatial dynamics of carbon inputs into soils. And all of these things have a strong influence on the microbial community and their processing of organic matter and their formation of soil organic matter, okay? So it's this diversification of resources and changes in the temporal inputs and the spatial inputs and our thinking is that this should really have an impact on soil organic matter formation. So we went to explore this at a field site at the Kellogg Biological Station. The interesting thing about this is that it's an organic and conventional site that are very similar in their management except for the organic site has these cover crops and the conventional one does not. The organic site uh, has fewer total carbon inputs because the productivity is low at these sites, um, the corn productivity because of the lack of fertilizer inputs. Um, but the total carbon inputs are lower, and yet look at that, the soil organic carbon is higher. So these organic systems have lower total soil carbon inputs. They also have more tillage because there's some tillage for weed control, and yet they have more soil carbon really unexpected, right? So we wanted to explore what were the underlying mechanisms behind this. We thought it had something to do with the cover crops, uh, which have a very low carbon to nitrogen ratio, are a really nutrient rich resource that the microbes should love. We thought that it would promote uh, greater microbial growth efficiency and growth rate and just a bigger, healthier microbial population having these cover crops in place. So let me make it clear, I'm not really thinking about the study so much as organic versus conventional per se, as it is one where there's a system with and without cover crops because these are in my mind the big differences between these systems. And so our thinking was that the changes in microbial physiology and carbon allocation will increase microbial carbon inputs to more stable carbon fractions. Uh, for those that are uh, working in other fields and farmers in the room, I know that's a bit jargony, but the point here is that we thought that the cover crops were going to improve the microbial physiology in ways that we would get uh, more resources being converted to soil carbon. So a higher proportion of new inputs should be converted to soil carbon in that organic system because of the higher growth efficiency and growth rates of the microbial communities. So we did a field experiment, and I'm not going to go uh, into detail, but we measured growth efficiency and growth rate in these fields. We also added new carbon inputs that were isotopically labeled. This allowed us to track these new carbon inputs into the microbial community and ultimately into different soil organic matter pools and actually test the efficiency of conversion of new carbon inputs into soil organic matter in these systems with and without cover crops. And that's what I want to show you today. And so, the microbial biomass in the organic system with cover crops was uh, a lot higher. We also saw 
Um, a much higher growth efficiency, MGE stands for microbial growth efficiency, and it was about 55% in the organic site with cover crops and 45% in the conventional. This means that when we measure just the microbial growth efficiency, 55% of new carbon inputs to the microbial biomass are converted to microbial biomass in the organic system, and only 45% are in the conventional. Those carbon inputs that are not converted to biomass are lost as CO2. So this higher growth efficiency indicates more biomass conversion to soil organic matter, less loss as CO2 in this system with cover crops. And this just shows that we also saw greater microbial activity and turnover in the organic system. So higher biomass, higher growth efficiencies, and higher microbial activity. And we also saw more carbon allocation to biomass. When we used the isotopic label, it ended up more quickly in the microbial biomass. And ultimately, with this isotopic label, we tracked far more new carbon inputs into soil organic matter in this site with the higher microbes with higher growth efficiencies, growth rate, and biomass. Organic matter was decomposing faster, there was a larger microbial community, and that biomass was then being converted. On the right, you can see two soil organic matter in the organic system. And I'm not gonna skip over that, and I just wanna point out that going forward, I think that it's really essential uh, to be using cover crops, and in particular, I think it's their roots that are really important. We did another isotopic labeling of a cover crop in the field um, where we grew it in an environment with C13 labeled CO2. We were able to track the root and shoot contributions to soil organic matter, and it was really the roots that got stabilized over time. And so I do think that we can be growing these cover crops, potentially even removing some of the biomass of the cover crops for biofuel industries and incorporating more roots that could incorporated more efficiently into soil organic matter. And I'm just going to end um, with this final statement that we've been studying plant productivity, plant litter quality, and the relationships to soil organic matter have been studied now for more than a century. Um, but what regulates microbial biomass contributions to soil organic matter? We've only begun to understand that. And I don't want to argue that the plant biomass is not important, but I think its main important is, is, is as a feedback to the microbial community and is a driver of the microbial community physiology and the microbial community structure. And that's ultimately what's responsible for soil organic matter formation is those microbes and their response to the new carbon inputs and in particular high quality and diverse inputs, not inputs that are necessarily recalcitrant and difficult to decompose like we've historically thought. Thank you.